This is I Was Eight. I'm Larry Fedorik, and welcome to my weekly storytelling podcast about growing up in a small town on the great Canadian prairie. This episode marks the end of season two. But don't worry, there's many more stories to come in the following seasons. Thank you for your continued support of this podcast, and I hope you enjoy this week's story. Chapter 13, Biking to the Lake. Our town was called Wakaw, W-A-K-A-W, Wakaw, about as central Saskatchewan as you could get. The word is from the Cree language, Waka meaning crooked. We learned this in school. And it was about as much homage as we paid at the time to the peoples who were first on the land. We also learned in school that Waka was a palindrome, the same frontwards as backwards, W-A-K-A-W. Of course, Waka is part of the world's longest and most clever palindrome. Let me see if I can remember it. Uh, Waka, a man, a plan, a canal, Panama, Waka. I think that's how it goes. Waka is a reference to our lake. Before the town of Waka, there was Waka Lake. The lake was before the town, of course. The lake was a long and thin and, yes, crooked body of water that hundreds of years ago might have been mistaken for a river. It was, is, a lake. It was where us town kids spent many a glorious summer day. I never understood why the town wasn't built around the lake. What a lovely spot it would have been for a town. Instead, our town was five miles away from the lake. How does that make sense? My suspicion is that years ago, those who planned the railways and the highways were idiots, possibly also lazy. As we know from the internet, lazy and stupid is no way to go through life. Our town was built right between one of the main provincial highways and one of the main provincial rail lines. Okay, that makes sense. But years ago, you could have just inched those two lines over every few feet, just over there a little bit, yeah, so that they passed nearer the lake and we could have a town on the lake. Waka on the lake we could have called ourselves. Instead, the lake, which we loved, was way, way over there. And you couldn't live by the lake unless you were rich. Your money was spent on a home in town. Only rich people could afford a second home five miles down the road at the lake. It's ridiculous. Planners were lazy and stupid, in my opinion. Never occurred to them where they were too lazy to figure out how to go nearer the lake. And I feel that way about a lot of early city planners as well. You know, they had no idea what they were doing and they didn't care to learn. If you owned a home by the lake, you called it a cabin. Some parts of the country call it a cottage. You have a cottage by the lake. In Saskatchewan, you have a cabin. I prefer the term cottage, but down the road, where the town should have been, were many cabins. Cabins by the lake. Some of the townsfolk had cabins there, but mostly cabins were owned by people from the city largely Saskatoon, the rich, spoiled, hoity-toity kids from the city who invaded our beaches every summer, and the high school boys who pursued our women folk. We, of course, were the local yokels, the hicks, as it were. The biggest area around Wakaw Lake was called Poplar Beach. We called it Popular Beach, mainly because we're hilarious and because it was very popular. That's where most of the big cabins were. The beach itself was huge and well-maintained. 
They had a general store slash cafe, which had fantastic pinball machines. They had change rooms there, plenty of launch and docking places for boats, a sports ground, and a dance hall that would play heavily into my teen years. We weren't one of those townsfolk that had a cabin at Poplar Beach, but one day we would. As an eight-year-old, I remember my parents talking about one day getting a cabin. We would save everything for it, in case, the one day we had a cabin. An old chair? We didn't throw it out. It was up in the rafters in the garage. Gotta save it. What are we gonna sit on when we have a cabin? One day we got a new kitchen radio, and the old radio? Saved for the cabin. An old dresser? I'm gonna paint it up and save it for when we get a cabin. Nothing ever got thrown out. Actually, not a bad way to go, I guess, as opposed to our disposable society today, but wow, it was nuts. Did you just bend that wire hanger? What if we need a hanger one day at the cabin? Sorry. As a kid, I never had the experience of our own family cabin, but after I grew up and moved away, my parents did get that cabin by the lake. I visited once, and it was like a museum of my childhood. Everything they had saved was in there, fully furnished in the decor of when I was eight. It was fantastic. The town kids didn't go to Poplar Beach that much. Certainly our family didn't. We didn't own a cabin or a boat. Occasionally my dad would uh, rent a boat or borrow a friend's boat to go fishing. Listen, I know fishing is a fantastic pastime for many people, but I don't know. Dad would wake me up at five. We'd be on the lake at sunrise. Sooner or later, I'd get a hook stuck in my finger. By 8 a.m., Dad popped a couple of beers he'd brought along. He'd give me a few sips. Half an hour later, I was asleep. Passed out drunk at age eight. He'd wake me when we got to the dock, and I'd sleep in the car all the way home. At home, I'd go back to bed and wake up hungover, and it wasn't even noon. Fishing. No, no, the kids didn't go to Poplar Beach much. For one thing, it was five miles from town. My point again on that about the town should have been, yeah, yeah. That's a hell of a bike ride for a kid, five miles. A bike ride on a busy gravel road, no less. You know, years before we were all born, a kid named uh, Roddy McIntosh was biking on that road and a car kicked up a stone and took out his eye. Another kid, Ivan Dulger, was hit by a Pepsi truck there and killed. We believe those stories. I did have to ride that gravel road on occasion on my bike. If I saw a car coming, I would ride my bike into the ditch drop it there, and run 20 yards into a farmer's field until the car passed. Took a lot of extra time, but you know, better safe than sorry, better alive than dead. Us local kids, well, we had another spot on the lake just for us. Scott's Point. The way the Crooked Lake bent around, Scott's Point was maybe a mile from town. Quiet dirt road, hardly any traffic. No stones to take your eye out. No city kids knew about it. No one much boated or fished around there. The beach was tiny, but there was a beach, a beautiful area of sand put there by the owner of the property, Dr. Scott. Yes, it was private property, but no one had lived there for years, and no one enforced dozens of school kid trespassers spending a summer day there. If you didn't wear your bathing suit under your jeans, you changed in the bushes. And further into the bushes was Dr. Scott's long-ago abandoned cabin. No one our age actually remembered a Dr. Scott or any member of the Scott family, but we knew Scott's Point. That was our own private beach and swimming hole. I don't recall any parents ever being at Scott's Point. It was just for us, just us kids. You biked out there in the morning and got home in time for supper, maybe. It was a time and a place, you know, where kids just went out for the day. Lateness wasn't even measured by a clock. It was measured by a calendar. Geez, we haven't seen little Larry for about four days. Maybe we should start asking around. 
Well, of course, not quite that bad. But yeah, you know, Mom and Dad, I'm out for the day. If anyone calls, please take a message. The only responsibility you had was to stay alive and get home, preferably sooner than later. There I was, sweating it out on my bike on a back dirt road, lunch in a thermos wrapped in a towel, bouncing around to the basket of the three-speed CCM. You passed a spot called First Point, which kind of is where the lake started. You didn't swim there, it was all reeds and muck. A few minutes later, on your left, Green Grove, also private, owned by the Orthodox Church and used for Bible camp. That was for the Orthodox city kids, so they could have the experience of the trees and the lake and the countryside for a few weeks each summer. The only catch was you also had to read the Bible. Green Grove meant you were only minutes away from Scott's Point, the broken old gate. You used to have to walk your bike over the forest path till you got to the clearing. And then there was the beach, the lake, and most all of your friends. Once in a while, there'd be a few high schoolers there, necking it up with each other on a blanket in broad daylight. Gross. It would be a few years before I came to appreciate the vision of a girl in a bathing suit. We'd tease them and they would yell at us, but it was weird. It was like, sorry bullies, Scott's Point is outside of your jurisdiction. You may lord over us in town, but we're at the lake now, so nya 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 nya. Speaking of staying alive, if you had your lunch, you had strict instructions that after you ate your lunch, you couldn't go in swimming for at least 30 minutes afterward. We thought this was because the fish would still smell the food and attack us. Well, you know, how the hell did we know when 30 minutes had passed? So we told my idiot friend Philip to count slowly to 300, and when he was done, put a stone on his towel and start again. Once we saw he got to six stones, we told him to stop and we all went back into the water after lunch. Good old Philip. Sometimes you didn't bring lunch, you just brought candy from the candy store. Now our parents had told us that candy was not food. Ergo, not lunch. So we reason you could eat all the candy you want and still go in swimming. As a matter of fact, Roly Messner invented this thing where he'd bite both ends off a Twizzler. He'd put it in his mouth and walk into the water till the water was just over his head. And then he'd breathe through the Twizzler. Ah yes, the Twizzler. Not just delicious licorice, but life-saving underwater breathing apparatus. Not to be used as a life-saving underwater breathing apparatus. Biking to the lake and days at Scott's Point. Some of the fondest memories I have about growing up in a small town. A small town near a lake that should have been a small town on a lake. Well, be that as it may. I read something a long time ago. I can never seem to find the exact quote, so I'll paraphrase. The greatest thing about happiness is the feeling that you'll be like this forever. That was it. Of course, you aren't. That's life. I do remember even on those exhausting bike rides home from the lake, disappointed that the day was over. But then you'd always think, hey, I can just do this all again tomorrow. I Was Eight is a weekly series written, produced, and voiced by Larry Fedorik. A new episode every Thursday. Share your stories with Larry, or if you like, share Larry's stories with a friend. This podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Larry Fedorik, that's F-E-D-O-R-U-K, can be reached at LarryFedorik37 at gmail.com.